Well, after watching that video, it's hard to not be moved by the needs of children. And Jill, thank you so much for your uh, description of what OCC does. We love the ministry. And it's also a reminder that we only have about four and a half months till Christmas. So maybe you can get started on your Christmas packing now. Indeed, the year has flown by, and uh, so has our summer. In fact, we've, if you haven't been with us, we've had a very, very Daniel summer this year. Not only have we been preaching through the book, but our summer adventure uh, had, took up the theme of Daniel. And just this past week, our music camp also took up the theme of Daniel in a very modern rendition of something called Danny and the Shacks. Uh, if you weren't here Friday night, it was a fabulous production, uh, just just wonderful. The music, I was actually singing the music in my head all yesterday after listening to the, to the show. Uh, but I just want to say a big thank you to all the volunteers who helped put that together. Uh, in particular, Lenore and Steve Tossi helped to head up the team. And so thank you so much for your hard work on everything that you did. It really was a great week. <clears throat> so maybe if we have a video, if you missed it, you can catch it on there. Um, if you're just joining us, Again, we're in the middle of our series on the book of Daniel, and we started the second half of the book looking at the four visions of Daniel 7 through 12. And so last week, we looked at Daniel 7 and saw how at the end, the saints finished that chapter by taking possession of the everlasting kingdom as the rider on the clouds comes to our rescue. Today, I would invite you to join me in Daniel chapter 8 which also takes us back before the narrative of Daniel and the lion's den. In fact, Daniel 8, verse 1, begins this way. Uh, Daniel says, In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. In my vision, I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam. In the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. Now remember, the vision in Daniel 7 took place during the first year of the reign of King Belshazzar. So this chapter fast forwards us two years. And in this vision, Daniel's transported roughly 200 miles to the east of Babylon, to the city of Susa, which is located in southwest Iran, and was considered the capital of the, of that, of the Persian Empire at that time. And after seeing this vision, Daniel is left sick for many days, and we will soon see why. And so before we begin the journey in Daniel 8, would you please pray with me? Father God, we come before you. Lord, we think about the needs of those that are in this world. We think about uh, the 1.9 billion children under 15 that we heard about this morning. Father, we pray that you would provide uh, physical needs, Lord, but also that you would provide uh, spiritual needs, that you would open many hearts up to the gospel through the work of OCC and through the work of so many churches and mission organizations around this world. Father, we're reminded that you're a good God, that you're a great God. And Father, as we look at Daniel 8 this morning, may you just, Father, may you just fill us with your peace, knowing that you are on your throne and that in the end, you will come and make all things right. So soften our hearts today, Lord. We ask that to hear your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a number of years ago, there was a film that came out entitled Cinderella Man. The movie told the true story of the man, a man named James Braddock, who had the nickname the Bulldog of Bergen County. Anybody from Bergen County in here? Okay, a couple. I was looking for a shout, but uh, hands will do. <clears throat> Braddock was an Irish-American boxer during the 1920s and 30s who contended for the light heavyweight title. That is, until he broke his right hand and was forced to give up boxing. Now, without his boxing income, Braddock had to work as a manual laborer on the docks near where he lived in New Jersey. And then the Great Depression hit. It hit the country hard and work was scarce, and so his family started to run out of money, and they were unable to pay their bills. The heat went off in their house, and it was a cold winter, and Braddock knew he had to do something. And so in his hour of need, an opportunity came up for him to go back to boxing. And so Braddock starts fighting again, and he starts winning. Because his right hand was injured, Braddock learned to fight with his left, which, he says, made him a better boxer. He got so good that he won his way all the way to the heavyweight title fight against the reigning champion at that time, a guy named Max Baer. Now, Baer was known for his, his vicious fighting style. In fact, he even killed people in the ring. He was so intimidating, he was arrogant, and he would, he would taunt Braddock into trying to drop the fight, but Braddock refused. And people were confused. They, they wondered, why, James, James, why would you fight even though you might die in the ring? What, was, what is your motivation? 
And every time he was asked about that, Braddock would simply say, I'm fighting for milk. I'm fighting to feed my family. And so he chose to fight even though the outcome was uncertain. Now, I wonder today if there's some of us in this room who are living in a place of uncertainty. Perhaps today you're walking through a season that feels like the Great Depression. Maybe you you keep stepping into the ring with a vicious boxer like Max Baer. It seems like in your life the evil forces are winning and you're in a dark, dark place. And so as you step into the boxing ring, you encounter your opponent. Maybe it's a challenging relationship. Maybe it's a terminal disease. Maybe it's constant financial problems. And it's then that you pray the prayer that the psalmist wrote in Psalm 13, How long, O Lord? How long will this suffering and despair that I'm experiencing last? Will today be the day that I'm knocked out? Or will today be the day of deliverance? Now, I suspect many of us have not spent much time in Daniel 8. In fact, many people just skip right over it as they're preaching through Daniel. They probably want to get to Daniel chapter 9 and find out about that prophecy of 70 weeks. What is that all about? Well, Pastor Dave is going to tell us in a few weeks. But I want to suggest to you today that if you're in that place of suffering and despair, if you feel like you're fighting for milk, then you need to meditate upon Daniel 8. Because it's a watershed chapter that forces us to confront two pivotal questions of our faith. The first question is this. Do you think God can speak supernaturally through his word? Do you think he can speak? And number two, do you think God knows the future? Do you believe that God knows the future? Do you really believe that? And our answers to those questions will determine how we read the Bible and what we believe about what God promises for our lives. Because you see, as James Braddock entered the boxing ring to fight Max Bear, he didn't know what was going to happen. But when we enter to the ring, there's someone who crosses the ropes with us. And the question is, what do you believe about him? And so as we'll learn today, Daniel had to confront those same questions. Daniel chapter 8, like the previous chapter, unfolds in three scenes, which I put on your outline. The scene of the fight, the bully, and then the thrill of the knockout. The fight, the bully, and the thrill of the knockout. And in each scene, we're going to learn something crucial about how we face suffering and despair. And so as we begin today, I have to say and let you know I'm indebted to the work of a guy named Sidney Gradanus and Brian Chappell, who really helped me understand this, this chapter of Daniel. I was greatly helped by their insights, and I truly hope you will be blessed as well. So let's begin with our first scene, the fight. The fight. Now last week we discussed the nature of apocalyptic literature, which the second half of Daniel 8, Daniel is written in. And often this genre is, is filled with mysterious images that are hard to interpret. Last week we saw a bunch of monsters coming up out of the sea. And for those of us who are visual learners, apocalyptic, apocalyptic literature is wonderful. We get lots of images. In Daniel chapter 8, we actually get the benefit of being told what those images mean. We don't have to guess. And so the precision of the prophecies in chapter 8 can give us comfort that God knows the future. So what exactly did Daniel see? Daniel 8, verse 3. I looked up, he says, and there before me was a ram with two horns, standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, and it grew up later. Well, after that, after last week, if you were here, these images seemed really tame. In fact, last week we had lions and leopards and bears. Oh, my! I mean, even Dorothy would have been scared. All right, well... There was no tigers in that chapter, but leopards are close. This week, we have a ram with two horns, which is surprisingly normal, right? But we're told that one horn on this ram grew up later and longer and later than the other one, and so we're, we're wondering, what, what do we make of that? What is that all about? In fact, even Daniel's confused. If you skip down and you look at verse 15 of this chapter, we're told that Daniel wanted to understand this vision, and so he gets a visit from the archangel Gabriel, And he hears the voice of God telling Gabriel to reveal the dream to Daniel. And this is what we learn in verse 20 of chapter 8. 
It says, the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia. Media and Persia. Now remember in Daniel chapter 2, the Medo Persian Empire represented the part of silver on the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw. And in chapter 7, last week, it was represented by a bear. Now one horn is longer than the other because the Persian side of the empire was stronger and more dominant than the Media side. Remember also that Daniel is seeing this vision during the reign of King Belshazzar. So this is before Babylon falls. But he catches a glimpse of what the Medo Persian Empire is capable of in verse 4. It says this I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and toward the north and toward the south. No animal could stand against it, and none could rescue from its power. It did as it pleased, and it became great. <clears throat> Whoa. This ram is a ferocious animal. It charged to the west and the north and the south. It achieved dominance. We're told none could stand against it. It did as it pleased, and it became great. And in a few short years, Daniel would see its power in full force as Cyrus and his empire overtake Babylon and kill King Belshazzar. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a ram, <clears throat> But when I was living in, in Colorado and looking in the mountains, I got to see a couple of, of these things out there. Um, they have huge horns. They often settle fights by ramming their heads into other animals. And so I wouldn't want to really have a disagreement with a ram because it would likely result in some broken ribs on my part. Very unreasonable animals, rams. And so the Medo Persian Empire is compared to a ram. It ran hard and fast, butting heads with world powers, conquering Babylon, Syria, Asia Minor, even making it to Europe and making raids into Greece, which was not a good idea because Daniel's vision continues in verse 5. It says this. It says, as I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes, came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came towards the two-horned ram, and I, I had seen standing beside the canal, and it charged at it with great rage. The moral of this verse is don't pick a fight with a goat, because now it's on, right? The ram thought it was tough, but if you ever come across an angry goat that looks a little bit like this, Hightail it out of there, right? <laughs> the catchphrase should really not be, don't poke the bear. It should be, don't poke the goat. Well, the ram does, and now the fight is on, and it's not going to go well for the ram. Verse 7, it says, I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram, shattering its horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it, and the goat knocked it to the ground and trampled it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. So this goat, with a prominent horn between its eyes, furiously attacks the ram, and the ram has no chance. Its horns are shattered, it's trampled quickly. In fact, one commentator said, this goat is like an NFL linebacker chasing down the quarterback. Have you ever watched a football game where there's an enraged linebacker? Yeah, they hit extra hard, and concussions usually follow. So the Medo Persian Empire, the ram, has its horns broken. But by whom? Well, in verse 21 and 22, the angel Gabriel doesn't speak in riddles. He tells us directly who this is. He says, The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. So we don't have to guess. It's Greece. The kingdom of bronze from Daniel 2, and the leopard with four heads from Daniel 7. The horn, the first king... Is Alexander the Great, which you've probably read about in your history books, who conquered the Medo Persian Empire with amazing, amazing speed. He was the angry goat who shattered the ram's horns. They didn't have a chance. In fact, history tells us that Alexander fought a battle against King Darius of Daniel 6 fame, and he defeated him despite being outnumbered 100,000 to 35,000. They were ferocious warriors, and after that battle, it only took Alexander three years to conquer the known world. The Medo Persian Empire fell, and Greece now ruled. By age 32, Alexander had it all. And if he were alive today, he probably would have worn a shirt that looked a little bit like this that he's the goat. Eat your heart out, LeBron. 
The debate is settled. Alexander is the one who is the goat. But the prophecy continues. The goat became very great. But at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off, and in its place, four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven. And so the goat became great, but at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off. Wow. Now, what does that mean? Well, I want you to notice two things about this verse. Uh, Number one, this is extremely accurate to what happened, extremely accurate. Alexander conquered the known world by age 32. By age 33, he was dead. At the height of his power, in his prime, he had everything, and he died. And how did he die? Did he die in battle, fighting another empire? No. He became sick. In fact, some people think he died of malaria or typhoid fever. In other words, he died of natural causes, and his kingdom was broken, shattered into four smaller kingdoms ruled by each one of his generals. Now, secondly, the text says that Alexander was broken off. And who, we might ask, was the one who broke him? Not a king of another empire, not a general who was revolting against him. No, he died of natural causes, which is to imply that God broke him. And as we've learned throughout this series, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. The only kingdom that will last is God's everlasting kingdom because only he is the true king. And so when we conquer, when we encounter suffering and despair, even persecution, when we are oppressed by some evil ruler and evil force, we need to remember this truth, that power is fleeting. Power is fleeting. You see, when James Braddock stepped into the boxing ring on June 13th, 1935, he was a 10 to 1 underdog. Nobody thought he would win. His wife was scared. She couldn't even listen to the fight. She had to cover her ears because she feared for her husband's life. James Braddock was fighting for the survival of his family. He was fighting for milk. And because of that drive, he captured the hearts of so many Americans who had fallen upon hard times. In fact, people by the thousands flocked to Madison Square Garden to watch this fight. And the bell struck. And Braddock ran into the middle of the ring to fight Max Bear, and round after round they traded blows, fight after fight. And Braddock is still standing in the end. There's not a knockout, but Braddock emerges victorious and is named the heavyweight champion. Max Bear is defeated in one of the greatest upsets in history. Why? Because power is fleeting. And when we're suffering at the hands of a powerful tyrant and we're in despair, remember, power is fleeting. Now notice again the precision of this prophecy. What God revealed to Daniel here actually came to pass. That Daniel is looking hundreds of years into the future. And so let me ask you the question again. Do you believe that God knows the future? Do you believe he is in control even in hard times? times that when we get in the ring, he's with us. The kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, but our God is still on his throne as we sang earlier today. Now, some of us may raise an objection here and say, Pastor Bob, I get that, but my suffering is greater than you can imagine. It's hard for me to believe that God knows the future. If he knew the future, why wouldn't he intervene in my situation? Why wouldn't he stop it? We find that answer to that that question in our second scene, the bully. The bully. You see, in the movie Cinderella Man, Max Baer was certainly a bully type of character. And we certainly see on the world's stage right now bullies of a sort. Dictators like Bashir al-Assad and Al-Assad and and Kim Jong-un are nefarious, even to the point of killing and murdering their own people to keep power. See, these bullies are all manifestations of human evil, types of antichrist, as we learned last week. Now, in Daniel's vision, we're about to meet another bully who puts all of these bullies to shame. Look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 9. This is what he sees. One of them, out of one of them, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. 
Well, now, if you were here last week, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? In chapter 7, we saw a little horn who fought against God and was judged and defeated just before the everlasting kingdom. And we discussed how there was a debate over who this person was. Was it the Roman general Titus? Was it the the Syrian king Antiochus Epiphanes? Was it a, a future antichrist? Who was it? Who is the little horn? Well, people continue to debate the identity of the figure in chapter 7. However, there is great consensus over who this is in chapter 8, that it is the Greek Syrian king Antiochus IV, Antiochus Epiphanes. And in chapter 7, the little horn arises out of the fourth kingdom, but in chapter 8, the little horn comes from the third kingdom, Greece. So let me introduce you to Antiochus Epiphanes. It is an understatement to say that this was a bad dude. He was more than a bully. He was downright evil. And he had his eyes set on the people of God. And when verse 9 says that he moved towards the glorious land, they're talking about the land of Israel. Antiochus hated God's people and persecuted them greatly. Listen to verse 10. It says this, It grew great, meaning the little horn, even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Now you may remember that in Genesis 15, 5, God tells the patriarch Abraham to look to the heavens, at the stars. And he says that his descendants will be as many as them, which is a clear reference in this verse to that verse in Genesis 15. That the hosts of heaven and the stars are God's people, and the little horn throws them to the ground and tramples them, which indicates severe, severe, severe persecution. Severe persecution. And there's some language in Revelation 12 that talks about this too, but this context is specifically referring to Antiochus. Let me tell you just a little bit more about him. After Alexander's empire was split into four kingdoms, one of them, the Seleucid kingdom, arose in Syria. And Antiochus was the eighth ruler of this kingdom between the years of 175 and 164 BC. He actually wasn't the heir to the throne. His nephew was. And Antiochus became the ruler because he bribed his nephew. And then he began his conquests. He he conquered Egypt in the south. He conquered Persia, Perthia, and Armenia to the east, but his eye was fixed on the glorious land Israel. In fact, his conquest of Israel is recorded in the extra-biblical book of Maccabees. And within Maccabees, we learn that Antiochus ordered his soldiers to cut down without mercy everyone in their path, young, old, women, children. In fact, we're told that he murdered any circumcised infant now, I acknowledge that that's pretty disturbing, but this is really what we're talking about here in this chapter. During his conquest, we're told that as many as 80,000 victims were killed in three days. 80,000. I mean, this guy was horrific. And that isn't all. I mean, it, it, one of Antiochus' favorite things to do was to take prominent Jewish families and bring them out in public and give them the choice to disobey God and worship Antiochus. And so he would tell them to eat unclean meat meat, or uh, do something that disobeyed the ceremonial law of their ancestors, and uh, if they didn't, they would be brutally killed. And I'll tell you how, so get ready. If they didn't disobey God's law, what he would do was cut out their tongues, lop off their limbs, scalp them. And if they were still alive, he would roast them on a fire as their family watched. Many Jews were martyred at the hands of Antiochus. In fact, there's a famous story in 2 Maccabees 7 where a mother had to watch seven of her sons die. And as she watched them go to their death, she would encourage them to die courageously, reminding them that the creator of the universe gave them life and breath, and his mercy would give life and breath back to them as they forgot themselves for Yahweh's sake. Now, I know that story is brutal and gory, but I share it with you to make a point. Yes, Antiochus was truly evil, and also because I think we think we have it hard in our world. 
In 21st century America, we think things are getting bad and worse, and we sometimes think we're suffering at the hands of people who hate our faith, but most people in most centuries were only a couple steps away from what Antiochus did to the Jews here. And so that should humble us. And if we look at verse 11, we see Antiochus wasn't finished. Verse 11, it says, It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. Now, to say here that Antiochus became as great as the prince of the host is to say that he attacked God himself because he did the unthinkable. Antiochus slaughtered the chief priests, and he attacked the temple itself. And when he entered the temple, we're told in Maccabees that he erected the abomination of desolation above the altar, which probably means that he he set up a a pagan statue of the Greek god Zeus and then above above the altar of burnt offerings, and then he sacrificed a pig on the altar to Zeus in God's temple, which made it impossible for the priest to offer any more sacrifices because the temple area was unfit for worshiping God, and so it became desolate. Antiochus insulted God even more by cutting up and throwing down the sacred scrolls with the law on them, and he even changed his name to Antiochus Theos Epiphanes, which literally means God manifest. I mean, this, this this guy thought he was God. He was more than a bully. He was evil. Now, again, I want you to notice two things about this particular passage. Notice again, and I'll emphasize this again, the precision of the prophecy All of these things that Daniel sees, we know from looking back in time, actually came to pass. And again, to put that in perspective, this this isn't a simple thing. Like, it's not like somebody in the 1980s predicting that the Boston Red Sox would win the World Series in 2004 after not having won for 90 years. And if you're a Yankee fan, I still feel the pain. This is like... This is like Christopher Columbus predicting that the Boston Red Sox would win the World Series in 2004, back in 1492. I mean, that is amazing. The prophecy shows that God knows the future and that God's promises are true, and it means that we can trust him and have peace because God knows all. Now, second, there was a reason that God allowed this to happen. Why? Why, you may ask. Well, verse 12, we're told this, and a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of what? Because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and will act and prosper. Now, Daniel tells us that the people were given over to this little horn, the burnt offerings of the Jewish people stopped, and the word of God was destroyed. Why? Because of transgressions. And now the story comes full circle. Because at the beginning of the book of Daniel, we see God giving his people over to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon to be taken into exile. Why? Because they disobeyed him and broke the covenant. And why does God hand them over to the little horn Antiochus? Because they disobeyed God's law and broke the covenant. And when Gabriel interprets this for Daniel, he confirms this truth. He says this vision is for the time of the end in verse 17 meaning the time of Antiochus, that a king of bold face will arise and his power will be great in verse 23, that he shall cause fearful destruction and he will succeed at what he does, verse 24. Why? Because of the transgressions of God's people. Now, can you imagine if you're Daniel watching this play out? (laughs) Right, we thought Daniel was there. (laughs) We're just talking about Antiochus for a while. Daniel, you're still here. But Daniel's dreaming this. He's watching this, and he's transported to the Persian Empire, and he's seeing these weird animals again, and then he learns that his people are suffering, that he sees far into the future, and it does not look good for Israel. This little horn, Antiochus, is doing unspeakable things. Just imagine. I mean, just imagine you get a dream, and you look in the future, and you see your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren suffering. This is what he was seeing. How would you respond? That Daniel's stomach probably churned and he wanted to pray and weep the words of the psalmist, how long, O Lord? How long, O Lord? And in verse 13, he hears the voice of Gabriel crying out to God, asking the same question, how long will this last, God? 
Now, before we get to the answer to that, we have to recognize a truth in this vision, a sobering truth, and it's this, that evil will have its day. Evil will have its day, and we wish it wasn't true, but we know deep down in our bones that it is that we live in a fallen world, and as, as a result, evil will have its day. In fact, I just read a devastating article in the news this week about a man in Texas who killed his two kids, eight years old, one years old, and left them in the apartment for their mother to find them. And my heart broke. And when I read things like that or I hear the news about chemical attacks of children in Syria or people dying of cancer, my heart cries out, how long, O oh Lord? How long? And I'm reminded that evil will have its day. But the question for us is not will evil have its day. It's how will we respond when evil has its day? Will we give up? Or will we trust that God knows the future, that, that he will do something about this world do you believe what Daniel saw last week in chapter 7, that, that God is going to come back, that he's going to judge this evil world, and he's going to make all things right? That when evil and tragedy strike, how will we respond? Let me share with you a story about a man who believed in God till the end, a man named Tony Snow. He was the former press secretary for George W. Bush. He was a Christian a champion for Christian values in the media, and he was diagnosed with terminal cancer and died at age 53, leaving behind three kids. And while he was dying, he wrote some profound words. He said this, he says, we want lives of simple, predictable ease, smooth, even trails as far as the eye can see. <laughs> but God likes to go off-road. He provokes us with twists and turns. He, he places us in predicaments that seem to defy our endurance and comprehension, and yet don't. The moment you enter the valley of the shadow of death, things change. You'll discover that Christianity is not something doughy, passive, pious, and soft. The life of belief teems with thrills, boldness, danger, shocks, reversals, triumphs, and epiphanies. We get repeated chances to learn that life is not about us and that we acquire purpose and satisfaction by sharing God's love for others. And then he finishes this way. He says, God, God doesn't promise us tomorrow. He does promise us eternity filled with life and love we cannot comprehend. And that one can, in the throes of sickness, point the rest of us toward timeless truths that will help us weather future storms. Through such trials, God bids us to choose. Do we believe or do we not? And he's saying this as he's dying. And I ask, how about you? When evil has its day, will you still choose to believe? Daniel had to choose that many times. In fact, he looked to his God even though he didn't know what was going to happen when he got in the ring. And friends, you might feel again like you're in the ring right now. You're taking punches to the, the stomach, to the face. And while evil may have its day, we need to have hope that evil will not hold sway forever. And we need to await the reality of our final scene, the thrill of the knockout. The thrill of the knockout. And church, here's where the grand story of Scripture testifies to this reality that evil may have its day, but it will not hold sway. So picture Daniel again, watching this vision play out, perhaps praying over and over, how long, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord. And then he gets his answer in verse 14. The angel says this, he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Now, we've just come from a dreadful scene of the little horn, Antiochus Epiphanes, slaughtering God's people and desecrating the temple of God. He's been beating the people of God in the ring, but there's hope. We're told the temple will be desolate for 2,300 days, and then it will be restored. And Daniel's saying, what? What? And again, I have to point out the precision of this prophecy, because we know, we know that the rule of Antiochus began in 175 B.C., that his attack on the temple probably occurred in 170 B.C., 
And we also know from history that this prophecy does indeed come true because in 164 BC, the Jewish leader Judas Maccabeus led an army to recapture Jerusalem, cleanse the temple, destroy the statue of Zeus, and built a new altar to Yahweh God. And the time between 170 and 164 BC was a little over six years or 2,300 days. 2,300 days, it was desolate. And we see that in that, what God promises, he delivers. What God promises, he delivers. What God promises, he delivers. Because the retaking of the temple is commemorated by the Jewish festival of Hanukkah and occurred on December 25th. So I'm telling you, I'm definitely feeling some Christmas in August today. But now you might be asking, what happened to Antiochus? Well, we learn that in verse 25. It says, but by his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many. Like, we know all that already, right? And he shall even rise up against who? The prince of princes. <laughs> and he shall be broken by no human hand. So we learn again the devastation of Antiochus Epiphanes, but in verse 25, we learn that he, like Alexander before him, is broken by no human hand. And again, you're asking the question, what does that mean? That it means that just like the ram shouldn't have messed with the goat, the little horn shouldn't have messed with the prince of princes. That when we get in a boxing match with the God of the universe, he's the one who's going to knock us out. And guess what? Antiochus Epiphanes did not die in battle. The man who claimed to be greater than God died of an infection in his bowels. Did you hear that? That he died of a bad GI virus, and he smelled so bad at the end that even his soldiers did not even want to be around him. The disease drove him mad. He was broken. He was humiliated. He was knocked out by no human hand, but by the hand of God himself. And in that, we see the truth of Daniel 8, that while evil will have its day, God will have the final say. That while evil has its day, we can always cling to the truth that God will have the final say. And friends, today you may be walking through a devastatingly hard season. You may be feeling the effects of the fall and you're questioning the purposes of God in your suffering. Never forget God will have the final say. That e the evil you may be experiencing now will be put to an end by no human hand. There is hope no matter the circumstance. But as we look at Daniel 8, let's not make a mistake. And the mistake we can make is this, that thinking that our faith will always result in earthly blessing. Let's not make the mistake of thinking that just because we have faith, it will result in earthly blessing. Now, I'm not saying that God will not bless us in this present age, but he doesn't guarantee it. We're guaranteed suffering and ultimate healing in the life to come when Jesus will come back and will make all things right. Then... God will have the final say. God will, will put evil to an end. God will guarantee it in the future. In fact, theologian Michael Horton rightly corrects us in our 21st century American thinking. He says this, our American gospel has become a gospel of following your dreams and being good so God will make all your dreams come true. But this has nothing to do with the God of the Bible. Instead, God calls us to see our suffering as an opportunity to build faith in him. And truthfully, our suffering may get even worse in the future. That God may be using our suffering to draw us closer to him, and I wonder, in that truth, could we be more like Tony Snow? As I heard somebody say one time, God's address is at the end of our rope. And once we've come to the end of ourselves, that is where we truly find him. God's address is at the end of our rope. And it's often there that we return to a childlike faith when we realize that we can't do it on our own. In fact, I think about my daughter, who's just 22 months old, and if you have a child who's around that age, you know what a joy it is. They may cry a lot when they don't get their way, but they're so full of joy and inhibition. And the greatest joy I find is when she needs help or when she falls down. Now, that may seem odd, but what I mean is that in those moments, 
when she's hurting, when she can't do something herself, she runs to me. She runs to her father. And she's going to cling to me and put her head on my shoulder. And in those moments, I whisper, it's okay. It's going to be okay. And I think for each of us here today, the same truth is a reality for us, that when we're hurting and when we're broken and when we're suffering, we need to run to our God who, as we sang, is a good, good father and let him sweep us up in his arms and whisper in our ears, it's okay. It's gonna be okay because evil may have its day, but I will have the final say. I will put all things right. I will restore the world, God says. Just as I restored the temple, I will, you will spend eternity praising King Jesus. And that's the message of Daniel 8. But you know, we read a chapter like this, and we probably feel a lot like Daniel did. And this is how he concludes in verse 27. Skip ahead two slides, please. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. And then I arose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Huh? Wasn't there supposed to be hope in this chapter? Instead, it ends with Daniel laying sick, being appalled by this vision. In fact, many of us may be appalled by the vision ourselves because we recognize the same thing that Daniel recognizes. It's a long way home. But getting home from Babylon will require a long, arduous road lined with the sufferings of Daniel's people. And Daniel doesn't want to see his people suffer. We don't want to watch those we love suffer. And the application is clear for us here. We're not home yet. Perseverance is needed. And while we're here, we need to be about the king's business. And so as we close today, let me exhort us not to make another mistake and think that our faith can disappear because we don't get earthly blessing. I've watched too many people walk away from the faith when things got hard because God didn't answer their prayers as they expected. What we need is faith in the storm, is faith in the fire, faith in the den, because they may be a preparation for the storms that are coming in the future. And it's only in the future that God is going to have the final say and provide the final knockout. In the meantime, we need to be about the king's business. We need to show people who are suffering that there is hope in the blackest of nights, that it will not last forever, that morning is coming, even if it's not tomorrow. The Jewish people had to wait 2,300 days for the temple to be restored, but it was. And Judas Maccabeus rode into Jerusalem on his war horse to put an end to that abomination of desolation. Let me invite the worship team to come on the stage. They have one more song for us. And while they do, let me remind you that the Jewish people celebrate Hanukkah each year to commemorate the restoration of the temple, that it remembers the hard-fought victory, and it's, it's known as the Festival of Lights, that once they retook the temple, Judas Maccabeus ordered that the temple be cleansed, that a new altar be built, and according to the Talmud, we're told that unadulterated and pure oil with the seal of the high priest was needed to light the menorah in the temple which needed to burn throughout the night every night. And it's told, as the story goes, that only one flask was found with enough oil to burn for one day, and yet it lasted eight days. Enough time to prepare a fresh supply of pure oil. And so an eight-day festival was commemorated to celebrate the event. But hundreds of years later, Jesus Christ enters the temple. And we're told in John 8, during the Festival of Lights, he gets up and says something very provocative as the candles and the torches are being lit. Because you see, while Judas Maccabeus should be seen as a divinely sent warrior to deliver God's people, we know that another warrior will ride on a horse to put an end to evil once and for all. The one who is greater than Judas Maccabeus, Jesus Christ, declared as the torches were lit, I am the light of the world. That Jesus himself is the one who will one day receive worship forever, who will usher in the kingdom of God, who has secured our future, and who will sustain his people living in exile. Do you believe that God knows the future? And if you do, 
Look at the picture that John paints for us in Revelation 22. He says, in the future, no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Because the final word is not had by the ram or the goat or the horn, but by the lamb. Evil may have its day, but God will have the final say. Amen?